soldiers of Christ arise Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be, and welcome to another episode of The Christian Report. My name is Vincent Hewlin. Well, in this episode of The Christian Report, we've got some great information we want to share with you. In this episode, we're once again going to answer some questions from the viewers. We've had a lot of requests for, for uh, uh, shows like this, and hey, we're going to take this opportunity to answer some of the viewers' questions. Now, in this episode, we're going to answer three questions. <clears throat> The first one, are there any living apostles today, much like what there were in biblical times? Number two, can I receive the power of the Holy Ghost? And number three, Vincent, why do you dismiss modern day tongue speaking? Now, I'm going to make a promise to you. In this episode, I'm going to answer all three of these questions. And I'm going to answer these not with how I think, how I feel, or what I believe. I'm going to answer all all three of these questions using nothing but the Bible. Okay, let's begin with our first question. Are there any living apostles today, much like what we read in the Bible? Well, before we can even answer that, we have to, to find out what the word apostle actually means. Well, we see in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul writing to the church in Rome, and he refers to himself as an apostle. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Peter does the same thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter refers to himself as apostle. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But a lot of people don't realize that Jesus himself was also called an apostle. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, speaking of Jesus, it says, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That's very interesting, isn't it? So we have to look at how the word apostle is used in all three of these verses. We go back to the original Greek text. Now this lesson may be a little bit deep, but I promise you it's going to be so easy, everyone's going to get it, okay? We go back to where the word apostle is being used. We look at the original Greek word, and it's apostolos, which means a messenger or he that is sent. And we know Jesus was sent by, by the Father. It's mentioned about 34 times that I found within the New Testament. So we know what the word apostle means. It means a messenger or he that is sent. Well, there were 12 apostles at one point sent to the lost sheep of Israel. This is the first commission that Christ put on these 12 apostles. Some people refer to it as the limited commission because they were limited who they were going to take this preaching to. In, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 7. It says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So he's given them just one direction to go, verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, just, it's really close. Okay, so that was the what people refer to as the limited commission, but Jesus sent these people forth. They were apostles. Well, we see later the Great Commission, where Christ sent the apostles and not just to a limited area, to the lost sheep of Israel, but to the whole world. Recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 19. And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What Jesus is saying there, here is that I have the authority to, to give you this command, to give you this, this direction, to give you this commission. He says, go ye therefore, you know, because he's been given this authority, go ye and do what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That means in the name of or by the authority of. Doing what? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Don't leave anything out. Okay, so we saw where, where Christ sent some people, they were apostles, to do a, a slightly limited uh, commission, and then he's given them the great commission, go throughout the world and preach. 
So when we ask the question, are there any apostles today? We have to dig a little bit deeper. We have to ask bigger questions like this. The big questions are this. Does anyone today have the same miraculous abilities as the apostles within the Bible? Well, we're going to find that out. Does anyone today receive special revelations as the apostles within the Bible? Are there any living apostles like the original biblical apostles we see in the Bible today? Like, you know, the original 12, Judas, he died. Matthias came and took his place. And of course, Paul, he was the 14th. So are there, are there any apostles living today like those? Well, before we answer these questions, I want us, you know, I love for us to critically think. We're going to uh, ask these questions first. Can anyone be an apostle today like the original apostles? Or are there qualifications that must be met in order to be an apostle like the original apostles? Okay, again, I want us to do some critical thinking. Remember what the Lord told Isaiah, Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. I'm asking you, let us reason together and answer these questions only using the Bible. Okay, so can anyone be an apostle? Well, there's, there's certain qualifications. We find this using the Bible in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Now remember, Judas had died, and they're going to replace Judas. There's two people they're going to choose from. It, in verse 23, it talks about Joseph called Barsabbas, or, or Barsabbas who's surnamed Justice, and a man named Matthias. They're going to be picking between these two men who's going to replace Judas. Let's go to verse 21 and read. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained, chosen, to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabbas, whose surname is Justice, and Matthias. And of course, we know later, Matthias is the one that's chosen. But what we see here are the qualifications to be an apostle. The two qualifications that I can see right off the bat is that you've got to be alive during the baptism of John. Remember, John the Baptist came paving the way of Christ. You've got to be alive during that time, and you need to be a witness of the resurrected Christ. Now, some people are going to say, now, Vincent, what about Paul? He was an apostle. Was he alive during the baptism of John? Absolutely. Remember, he was standing under the feet of Gamaliel, uh, a doctor of the old law. And was he a witness of the resurrected Christ? You better believe it. On the road to Damascus, who did he see? Who did he speak to? Who did he see? And he was blinded. It was Jesus. See, Paul communicates this to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, right above my head. He says, and last of all, he was the last one, last of all, he was seen of me also, talking about Jesus, as one born out of due time. It was perfect timing. So Paul was the last one to see Jesus. If, if this is a requirement to live during the baptism of John, and you've got to be a witness of the resurrected Christ, well, we have to ask the question, can you be an apostle like what we read in the Bible? Can you? Well, folks, the only way you can be an apostle today like they were apostles in the, in the Bible is you're going to have to have something like above my head. You're going to have to have a time machine. So you can go back in time to the baptism of John and witness the resurrection of Christ. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. See, there's no more apostles. They've died. And since the, and we're going to discuss this further in this episode, since there's no more apostles, there's no more people that have that miraculous ability. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, again, Paul's uh, preaching, he, or writing to the church in Corinth. This is the first letter. And he, he writes to them, charity never faileth. That word charity comes from the Greek word agape, that's love, it's unconditional love. He says, charity or love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, or the people giving predictions, they shall what? Fail. Whether there be tongues, that word tongues comes from the Greek word gloss, it means a natural language. We're going to talk about that later too. They will cease. Whether there be knowledge, and you're going to say, what do you mean by knowledge? We That word knowledge comes from the Greek word gnosis. It means knowing. Go look in, in John chapter 14, verse 26. When Jesus made the promise to these apostles that the comforter is going to come and and and, and uh, allow them to know all things that Jesus taught. They're going to have all knowledge of what had Jesus been teaching. These are the gifts of the Holy Ghost. 
And it says that the, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And Paul says, for we know in part. See, not everybody had every one of the gifts. There's nine. We're about to go over that. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But, on the other hand, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. What's he talking about that in part? Well, these, these uh, holy, uh, the gifts of the Holy Ghost that the people have, because not everyone had every one of the abilities, and these abilities had one purpose, and that was to prove that Christ was Messiah. And so, and people would receive that knowledge so they could preach, you know, that spread the gospel. You know why they, they, had, they needed that knowledge? Because they didn't have what we have. They, don't, they didn't have a Bible. It hadn't come yet. And is this Bible perfect? Is it complete? Is it mature? Because that's what that word perfect means. Tell us it means complete mature. Absolutely. But that which is perfect is come. Why is it perfect? The Bible's perfect. It has no contradiction, contradictions. It's perfect. It has come. So that which is in part shall be done away with. Those gifts are done away with. Only by the laying on of the apostles' hands could someone even receive the Holy Ghost. Okay, it, it required an apostle to lay on hands to receive the Holy Ghost. We're going to prove this with Scripture. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 and 17. All right, we know that uh, uh, Philip had left Jerusalem because the Christians were under persecution. Only the apostles were left in Jerusalem. Right? And where did Philip go? Into Samaria, preaching unto them Jesus. And they accepted what he preached, gladly. They put on Christ in baptism. And, well, let's read the Bible. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they come down, prayed for them. Why would they be praying for them? <clears throat> that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as of yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, on a side note, some people will say, Vincent, in Acts 2.38, y'all talk about it all the time, I've got my reminder here, what Peter told the uh, first recorded gospel sermon, in the, in, the, in the Bible, what Peter told all those of the day of Pentecost, the, the Jews that were there for that feast. And he, he said unto them, when they were pricked to the heart, they found that, that, that they were a part of, of putting Christ on that cross. He told them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Many people would die, well, today will say, oh, well, when I'm baptized, I receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't. Because if you do... Why didn't the Samaritans receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? For as of yet, he was fallen, the Holy Ghost had fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because we had to have, Philip was not an apostle. We had to have apostles come. That's when Peter and John, they came out of Jerusalem, went into Samaria. And what did they do? They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. This is one of the examples that shows that we don't receive, automatically receive the gift of the Holy Ghost upon baptism. If so, then God's a respecter of persons. We know in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, he's not. That would mean that he's showing more respect to the people in Acts chapter 2 than he would the, that obeyed the, uh, the, obeyed the gospel than the people in Acts chapter 8 that obeyed the gospel. See, another verse, and there's many, that proves that the apostles had to lay their hands on someone to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost is right above my head. Later in the same chapter, Acts chapter 8, verse 18, when Simon the sorcerer, when he saw that through the laying on of hands the apostles... Uh, uh, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. What did he do? He offered money. He didn't understand. See, that's how the Holy Ghost was transferred to somebody. was bought by the laying of hands by an apostle. So, are there any living apostles today like what we see in the Bible with these, these miraculous gifts? There's not. If there is, prove it. That's all you got to do. But there's just not any like what we read in the Bible. Well, Question number two, can I, can we receive the power of the Holy Ghost today? Now, a lot of people watching this show is going to say, absolutely, Vincent. Well, let's see what the Bible says. All right. Can I receive the power of the Holy Ghost? First, what exactly is the power of the Holy Ghost? What are these gifts? They're outlined, all nine of them, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. All right. For one 
this is what Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, writing to Christians. He says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith. Now, I'm going to stop there. Some people are going to say, oh, so the only way I can get faith is by the laying on of hands for an apostle because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a special kind of faith. To give you an example, go to James chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. If you want to study it further with me, there's my personal cell phone number, okay? To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers or various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Or we already discussed that word tongues, and we're going to discuss it further, is a known language. So we had someone who could speak various languages that they're not used to speaking and people that could understand various languages that they weren't used to speaking. This was something they needed if they're going to go out throughout the whole world preaching the gospel. So we got wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, uh, discernment, tongue speaking, and tongue interpreting, or language speaking and language interpreting. All right, that's all nine. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right, some of the examples of these powers being used. All right, Acts chapter 3, verse 6, Peter and John doing great work for the Lord. A lame man is healed. The lame man asks, you know, for help, and Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of, or by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, my friends, every time you see a miracle being done, there's two things happening. It's instant, and there's nothing hidden. It's without a doubt. Just like in the next chapter, Acts chapter 4, verse 16, we see where the Jewish rulers are talking about this lame man that had been healed. And they said, what shall we do to these men, Peter and John? Why? For they, for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest. It's been revealed to all that live or that dwell in Jerusalem. All, not just a little bit in Jerusalem, all that live and dwell uh, that dwell in Jerusalem know about it, and what they cannot deny it. That's a miracle. Nothing hidden. All right. Another example of a miraculous power: well, the apostles are on Solomon's porch. Acts five fifteen through sixteen. They brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. They were, uh, uh, verse 16, there came a multitude out of the cities, ran about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them that were, which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Is that how it's done today? You don't see that today. Because people can't do that today. Another example of miraculous powers. Acts chapter 9, verse 33 through 34. Peter at uh, Leda, I think that's how it's pronounced. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years. This man was sick with the palsy. He'd been in bed for eight years. That's like 2,900 something days. He'd been in the bed. He's not faking it. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And what happened? He arose immediately. No waiting, no guessing games, nothing hidden. After eight years, he arose. Another example. Bear with me. We're talking about the deputy. All right. Acts chapter 13, verses 8 through 11. But Elimaeus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. See, they had brought, Paul and, and the disciples of Christ had brought the, the, the gospel, and this deputy was believing. And, and Elimaeus wanted to turn him away from the faith. And then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. He set his eyes on Elimaeus, and he said very nice words because he didn't want to offend anybody. No! He said, oh Full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. At one moment, Paul has got the gift of the Holy Spirit, he's healing people, and now he's, in, he's inflicting something on somebody. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately, immediately, there fell on him mist and darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand because he was blind. 
That's how it's done. Instantly, no waiting. Another example of miraculous powers. Talking about Acts chapter 9, verses 37 and 40 through 42. Talking about a lady named Tabitha or Dorcas. A fine, God-fearing woman. It came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. But Peter put them all forth. Kneeled down and prayed. Turning him to the body. No hooping. No hollering. None of this theatrical stuff. He said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Can anyone do that today? You know they can't. And he gave her his hand he, and lifted her up. And when, she had, when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all of Joppa. Nothing hidden. No secrets. No, no guessing games. And why, what happened there? Many believed in the Lord. Amen. Another example of miraculous powers, Paul preaching all night. I love this one. I joke with Matt about this one. Paul's preaching all night. They're sitting in a window, a certain, a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep, and Paul was long preaching. He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. This man, Eutychus, fell from the third story, and what happened? He fell dead. But Paul went down and fell on him. That doesn't mean he just like fell on top of him. He, he kneeled down with him. And embraced him and said, trouble not yourselves for he, his life is in him. And boy, they, they rejoiced. This is what miracles are about. Another one, Paul discerning the truth, knowing if someone's lying or not. Acts chapter 26, verse 26 through 28. Remember, Paul is given a defense of why he's a Christian and, and his conversion to Christ. And, and he's talking to King Agrippa. He says, for the king knoweth of these things. That Talking about what Paul, you know, his, his, his belief in Christ. He says, before whom also I speak freely, for I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Paul was doing this out in the open. He was preaching the word, wasn't he? He says, King, he, this is a question. He says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And before King Agrippa could answer, he said, I know that thou believest. He knew that King Agrippa believed the prophets, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Did that make him saved? It did not. Just him believing alone, regardless of what the Baptists and Methodists and all the others will say, well, belief only saves. King Agrippa believed. Paul proved it with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same man that we're going to see does more great things in the in the uh, working for the Lord. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be, to be a Christian. Agrippa wasn't a Christian. He wasn't saved, but he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, just like the devils believe. James chapter 2, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Just because you believe doesn't mean you're automatically saved. Last example of a miraculous power, speaking in tongues. We're going to talk a little bit length about this. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, we see the apostles receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That word tongues, my friends, it comes from the Greek word glossa, which means a known language. It's exactly where we get our English word today, glossary, is from glossa. It's a known language. I'm going to prove that with this Bible. It's not gibberish. It's not someone just talking gibberish. Verse 8, How this is the people he's preaching to. About 17 different, different nationalities and how hear we every man in their own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya, and about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. What do they say? We do hear them in our tongues, our language, where they were born. What were they preaching? The wonderful works of God. They weren't up there going, Hematasi Matai, speaking some kind of weird gibberish. They were speaking a known language. That's a tongue. People take it out of context. Here's a fact. Can we receive the power of the Holy Ghost today? No. There's no living apostles today that can pass down this gift as we saw in the Bible. See, these powers are completely unnecessary today. They're not necessary. They were using them back then so they would have knowledge and so they could prove that Christ was the Messiah. We're going to cover that in just a second. See, the Bible was not in its completed form back then. It was being written. We're reading these letters that Paul wrote to Colossae, to Thessalonica, that he wrote to Timothy and Philemon. That's what constitutes the Bible now. But we have external proof 
to put our faith in. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, what Paul tells the church in Rome, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And right here's where the word of God is. That's where we put our faith. If it's not in that Bible, we put no faith in it. So why were miracles accomplished, Vincent? I'll tell you why. This is just a few examples. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, 17, to fulfill prophecy. John chapter 2, verse 11, to manifest, to reveal that Christ was Messiah so people would believe. Acts chapter 9, to turn people to the Lord so many will believe. In Acts chapter 13, and people did believe. I covered this on January the 31st, 2021. If you'd like to go to YouTube and look at it further. January 31st, 2021. So, can I receive the power of the Holy Ghost? I cannot. It's impossible. It's completely impossible. But the last question, Vincent, why do you dismiss tongue speaking today? I'll tell you why. We covered it. The, the, you have to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and there's no one today receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's no one speaking you know, in, in tongues, languages that they don't know miraculously. There's a lot of people speaking gibberish, but that's not speaking in tongues. Some people will say, but Vincent, tongue speaking is when people speak the language of angels. It's a heavenly language. Well, let's see how the angels speak. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. That's pretty understandable. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. See, there's no gibberish talking, and there's no one, you know, standing up to have to interpret gibberish. You don't, you, you don't find any examples of that in the Bible. The only place you find examples of that today is in, in denominations today. Acts chapter 12, verse 8, And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. That's how you see communication just a few of the examples of an angel speaking to someone. It's never gibberish. It's never a language that no one else understands. It's, it's, it's just the known language that they speak. How are they going to communicate? All right. So, folks, my friends, I believe in language speaking. I'm speaking a language now. I'm speaking a tongue now. It's English. It's North Arkansas English. It's all I've got. Okay? But I do not believe... In the gibberish that people speak. I found a video of this young lady. She's on YouTube. A lot of people reached out to her, but she's totally confused. I want you to compare it with what she says, but what we've read in the Bible. We've seen where miracles happen instantly. We see where there's and God's not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14 33, that it shouldn't be difficult. You know, the 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 gospel is common to all. We see that what Jude writes. But the bad thing is what Paul communicated to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, the Spirit speaketh expressly. All right, th this is it. That in the latter times, and we are in the latter times, the latter times just means in this dispensa dispensation, the New Testament times. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. If you're not following Christ, who are you following? So when people's teaching you something that has nothing to do with, with the, what's in the Bible, you put faith in it, you're not putting faith in God. You're putting faith in man's doctrine, not the Lord's. Listen to what she says. I have been praying in the Spirit for a few months now after being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, and it took me about seven years to receive the evidence of speaking in tongues. But I did it. But I did it. She but did I it. did it. But I did it. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to know the right way. You don't have to know the right way. We just have to give our heart to you. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to know the right way. We just have to give our heart to you. I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to know the right way. You don't have way. to know the right way. We just have to give our heart to you. She's just repeating the same gibberish over and over. Paul tells the church in Rome, Romans chapter 10, verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. This poor lady, she's just biblically ignorant. And that's why she's acting the way she is. My friends, why dismiss modern day tongue speaking? Because the Bible says it's gone. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, where there be tongues, they shall cease. There's over 3,000 copies of the Bible 
out there. We, we don't need to be speaking in tongues. Uh, God bless you. Give us a call. We love every one of you. We want you to know the truth. We love you.